So uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, actually, I visited this uh, state for the first time. Uh, and honestly, I wasn't know exactly the location <laughs> before. Sorry about that. <laughs> when you live in Texas for <laughs> more than two decades, you, sometimes you forget the Northeast exists, actually. <laughs> That's a joke, actually. <clears throat> So uh, uh, the goal today is to really talk about best practice of inflammatory breast cancer. So 80% of my talk will focus on uh, what will be the best care for IBC. And then toward the end, I'll talk about a little bit about research and where things are heading. Okay. So there are certain facts that I need for you to understand. Uh, IBC is one of the most aggressive form of breast cancer. Uh, it represents probably about 2 to 4 percent of breast cancer in the United States. Unfortunately, because of the aggressiveness, if you look from the mortality perspective, the U.S. breast cancer mortality, it may represent close to 10 percent. So when you are seeing a lot of a newly diagnosed breast cancer, you may not feel like this is a really a health, social health issue, but when you come to clinic with a lot of advanced disease, you'll suddenly notice that there are many patients who has history of inflammatory breast cancer. When you look at the world level, if you go to like North Africa or West Africa, like Senegal, Egypt, okay, uh, the diagnosis of inflammatory breast cancer could represent about uh, 25 to 30 percent. Sometimes, and this number fluctuates between like 15 to 30, but clearly it is much higher than uh, what we see in the United States. Uh, initially, a lot of people felt that this is due to uh, it's a developing country and it's a delayed diagnosis, and that's actually mimicking the inflammatory breast cancer, but. There was a team from the United States who has, from the NCI, visited these countries and confirmed that indeed, uh, for some unknown reason, that the incidence of inflammatory breast cancer is high in North Africa. So why is it aggressive? Uh, and there are a couple things uh, we need to talk about. One is, by the time the patient presents with inflammatory breast cancer, and I'll talk about the futures of IBC later on, but like, like, the, like the redness of the breast or the breast encouragement, one-third of the patient will already have metastatic disease if you conduct like CT scan or PET CT scan. There are, there's tendency to not to respond to standard like chemotherapy. And even despite of good response, they have still a tendency to disease to come back or metastasize. So you can see here that these are uh, different colors with different curves from the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And these are survival curve. And you can see that the curve is pretty much overlapping. Um, and this, this is, MD Anderson data, and we have really made a lot of effort of trying to improve the treatment, but the actual survival data hasn't really improved that much. So the question is what to do about this. So we have some challenges. So the challenge is, is uh, why inflammatory breast cancer is difficult? Well, it's, it's a clinical diagnosis. Uh, many disease actually has clinical diagnosis, but over the past two decades, what we call what we call molecular diagnosis. So there is some kind of genetic testing or certain characteristic that you could actually confirm by microscope and confirm the diagnosis. But IBC is more of what you see decides what you have. And that sounds kind of okay, but when you actually do research, it, it makes it difficult because the definition is very not very clear. And then this IBC is uh, very heterogeneous. So even this IBC will have estrogen receptor positive IBC, you will have triple negative IBC, you have HER2 IBC. So that adds more complications. And what makes it more difficult is 
laboratory uh, research. Uh, so in the past, we didn't have enough cell line, even animal model, to conduct the, the research. And so if you don't have a lot of uh, research samples uh, or research models, it makes it difficult. So why is it difficult to get research sample? Well, the breast is engorged, but it's not a mass. So the disease is scattered over. So it's not like regular breast cancer. You stick a needle and you get a chunk of tissue. And sometimes you do, but probably there's more than 50% of the time you will not have uh, s sufficient amount of the tumors. So if you don't have a lot of research, you end up having not a lot of clinical trials. And particularly, maybe like 10 years ago, uh, there was really not a lot of uh, trials. Currently, like Duke, uh, Dana-Farber, uh, or MD Anderson, or uh, Northwestern, uh, there are some university that's very focused on inflammatory breast cancer, so there are more clinical trials, but still it's very limited. I mean, if you think like West Coast, I don't even know who I should really refer you for the IBC specialist. So let's talk about standard care of IVC and what we need to do. And I'm going to go in more details, but I want to like for you to understand the flow of the, the care. So one thing is that the moment the patient comes, we would like to get mammogram, ultrasound, MRI mammography. We would like to get consult with surgery, radiation, medical oncology, EKG, echo, PET CT, or CT scan, bone scan. So pretty much we will schedule all above testing and console probably within the first one week. We will make that effort. And particularly, the key is to make sure the surgeon, the radiation oncologist, will see the patient before the medical oncologist start some kind of chemotherapy. Uh, it is not a good practice, just blast of chemo, and towards the end, you will have a surgery like what we call modified radical mastectomy, and have the surgeon come by and, hey, let's take it out. Well, yeah, well, it's the same surgery. No, it is not the same surgery because the surgeon and the rad on have to really see the original extent of the disease where was the skin was red. And these are very important. And that's one of the, the key things that sometimes in community practice, it does not happen. And what happened is that because it's not confirmed up front, the extent of disease is not confirmed, so there is always a chance that you may not take the, the tumor out completely. So the key is that it is important to give chemotherapy before surgery. Okay? And as you know, that there are two ways of treating breast cancer. You could do surgery and chemotherapy, but the bottom line of the current standard care for locally advanced breast cancer, including inflammatory breast cancer, is to provide what we call nail adjuvant chemotherapy or preoperative chemotherapy. And why is it important? Because when you go for surgery and you look under the microscope, and if you could confirm there is no disease, what we call pathological complete response, PCR, the outcome is better. And you could see that this is a disease-free survival and probability of DFS over like one decade. So if you achieve pathological complete response in IVC, which is a blue line, and the red line, which is non-pathological complete response, you could see the chance of disease coming back is very different. But there's something that I need everybody to notice, which is very different from the regular breast cancer. So could anybody say what's, what's different? Okay, so the difference is, yeah, what? Hmm? Plateau, the steep decline in plateau. Ah, yes. One is, yes, steep plateau for the PCR, and one is a real rapid, you know, decrease. That's one thing for sure. But what I'd like for you to, like you just mentioned, the plateau, Despite the PCR, meaning that the tumor melted away from chemotherapy, there's still about 30 to 40% chance disease may come back. Now, this is a little bit old data, 
So I know some of you are patients, and then I'm not trying to scare you. I, this is a f five to 10 years old. So the currently probably the curve is a little bit more upswing with a current conventional chemo. But still, comparing to non-inflammatory breast cancer, even with a great response, that disease could still come back. That means that there's a different mechanism that drives the cancer to become aggressively aggressive. All right, so then the next uh, characteristic is that this is a little bit busy slide, but it has black as a triple negative, which is an ER negative and PR negative, HER2 negative. And then the blue is a hormone receptor negative, HER2 positive. The red is a hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative. And the green is hormone receptor positive and HER2 positive. So different molecular subtype, typical thing you see in breast cancer. So the left is what we call the disease-free survival, and the other one is overall survival. So this is what we see with inflammatory breast cancer. Okay, so this is also, as a data, okay, very different from what you know from the regular breast cancer. So where is, uh, what's different? This curve is something not right if you, if, uh, uh, compared to, uh, uh, co if you look as, if you're just treating regular breast cancer. What's not right? Okay. So what's not right is uh, estrogen receptor positive patient don't do well. So usually, if it's a non-inflammatory breast cancer, the curve will, co will start separating. So, so everybody talks about hormone receptor positive breast cancers. They're going to do well. You get hormone therapy and life is beautiful. Well, here you can see that, of course, the triple negative is probably have poor prognosis compared to the other subtype, but all the line is pretty much kind of uh, all together, right? So, it, so one thing I need for you to understand is that this disease is intrinsically derived from the original characteristic, and it's not simply derived by like estrogen receptor positive. So if a medical oncologist says, oh, you're ER positive, you're very lucky. Well, you're lucky from sense of providing some kind of treatment, but it's hard to, for me to say that you're completely out of the wood. And these are information that sometimes many of our uh, uh, breast physician, even with an academic breast physician, may not recognize. So let's talk about how they present, okay? And I uh, pulled this from the Dr. Bess Overmeyer's uh, Dana Farber site, uh, which was very nice to really provide like redness of the breast, breast swelling, pain, uh, thickening of the skin, and lymph node positivity. Yeah, so these are the typical finding that we like to see, okay? But, and in the su success of the advocates, uh, like Terry Arnold, you know, trying to tell what is important to recognize for the IVC, which is nice, but there are some issues that you need to understand because some patient will present with like a very small amount of redness, okay? So they come early, actually. So now we're detecting these patients doesn't have the entire breast swollen, but locally just kind of swollen and it's red. And then we don't call them IVC and they are going to mastectomy. And after the mastectomy, they go into this rapid progression. So in the past, uh, good or bad, you give antibiotics, right? And you give a second round of antibiotic because you believe that it's more like mastitis or infection and there was a delay and the redness continues to spread. So therefore, by that time, you meet the standard criteria of like, oh, this looks like inflammatory breast cancer. And those are definitely an issue for us, but the question that we're facing now is what is appropriate you know, way to make a diagnosis of IVC because we may capture this disease early and then you felt like, oh, we need to take them to surgery because it's small. And then by, you know, and if sometimes, fortunately or unfortunately, why we're working up the patient with all kind of testing within a week, it spreads and it suddenly says, oh, it's IVC. But sometimes that opportunity may not exist. 
And those are the dilemma that we're facing. So I'm showing you a very, uh, I'm sorry people if you get nauseated, but, uh, but uh, uh, this is a very extreme presentation. So this is really, you know, swollen, the color has changed. Yes, I mean, do you, we don't see this type of IBC very recently because of the awareness, okay? Rather, it's going to be more toward like swollen, and you could see that there's a skin e edema, you could see these follicles, and then uh, that you could see, and there's a color change between the area. So those are probably mm, still the second common one. So this is more common that we see these days. It's hard to say, but you see the left, okay, comparing to the right, it's swollen, right? I know it's a little bit light, uh, 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 bright, too bright to see, but you can see the color changes. It's actually just some redness here. And these are the things that we will call IVC. And then if you do like PET CT scan, you could see that there's skin thickening compared to the before, and you could see that the FDG uptake is all over the places, so it's very active disease in the entire breast. And more difficult one that we are currently seeing is like this one. See, it's really slight redness. And then this breast actually, two weeks later, it really went to like full-blown IVC. So uh, we have to suspect and we have to really pay attention. I mean, I'm not trying to suggest to you that you should wait and see what happens, but I want you to understand that there's a kinetic. Uh, woman and, uh, well, male breast cancer is only about 1%, but woman does have more awareness about breast cancer, but the awareness is generally focused on a mass, not focused on skin changes, Further, there's not too much of focus on the kinetic of the redness. And it's not just about for the patient, but even at the physician level, this awareness is completely missed. So, so you start to wonder that whether we're missing the diagnosis of IVC, and you have to remember that MD Anderson is a tertiary cancer center, and some patient, the disease progression is so fast so if you were able to come to our hospital, already we have a bias, right? Because some people become ill so fast that they can't come to like a large cancer center. So there are probably that we're estimating that there are a lot more patients out there that who is not potentially receiving appropriate care, okay? So let's talk about diagnostic imaging. So at our centers, we do look into three imaging modality, mammogram, breast ultrasound, and MRI mammography. So the mammogram is an important tool for screening, and I think the first thing to consider is mammogram. But, and what, do you, what could you see? Well, skin thickening, trabecular thickening, uh, trabecular distortion, increased breast density, calcification, actually adenopathy. Well, we see this, but you have to remember that we also see patients who has nothing, actually. So they have the typical clinical feature that I just showed you by the picture, but the mammogram is completely negative. That doesn't mean that you don't have IVC. You still could have it. The other issue you face is mammogram is so painful, so adequate, particularly for IBC patient to go for mammogram is very difficult. So adequate mammogram is not conducted, and so therefore, there could be a delayed diagnosis or the imaging is not adequate, so you may not find the, the abnormalities. So, the issue of mammogram is it's the least sensitive modality and it may not be the most helpful diagnostic tool. And once again, I'm not telling you not to do it, but 
Whether that's going to be helpful once you make that toward the diagnosis of IBC. Is mammogram helpful? You, we always put, we still do it, but it becomes a little bit question mark. So what's helpful is ultrasound and actually the MRI mammography. And there are certain uh, characteristics like delayed washout with a plateau curve, which is con very common in IVC, which will help to make the diagnosis of the, of the IVC. And then you could see a lot more disease in the MRI and second, but followed by ultrasound comparing to the mammogram. And this is very important because for the surgeon, well, for the medical oncologist, you know, we're, we're, we're the drug dealer. So therefore, uh, you know, the imaging doesn't really have a significant impact. Rather, the impact it comes from the, the, the surgery that we, we were just talking about. So having a real good baseline imaging like ultrasound or MRI mammography for the radiation oncologist and surgeon, it will have an impact. So if you don't have an imaging, you will go by what's written in the chart. And further, if you don't have any picture, so if you don't even take a photography, you don't know what it looks like. And this is another issue that I commonly get, you know, you get a uh, referral from outside, there's not a single picture, and I can't tell what it looked like. The patient has actually, the patient is actually doing a selfie with their breast in iPhone, and I'm actually pulling out the selfie picture and putting into our medical record. And the patient is doing the right thing, but the physician <laughs> don't document. And it's important because that tells you the kinetic of the, 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 uh, the symptoms that you see. All right, so now once you know there's a few, uh, clinical future imaging, now you need to do the biopsy. So the main biopsy, obviously, is a core biopsy. And then if you have a lesion, if you have a mass, of course, you should put into the, the mass, right? I mean, of course. The problem is when you don't have a mass, you don't see anything, where do you go? Okay, so you go to the most suspicious area based on MRI or ultrasound. Now, if you don't see anything at all, where do you go? Well, you do a blind biopsy. And in addition, it's very important to map the, all the nodes, the extent of the lymph node, not just by imaging, but confirm where is your lymph node, positive or negative. And that's going to be very, very helpful for the surgeon and the rad on. And then you should consider skin punch biopsy. Now, the tricky part is I show you the breast is red. The red area doesn't mean there is breast cancer. Uh, we do suspect there's a breast cancer, but surprisingly, the red area does not mean that they always have the disease. Actually, the normal area, the normal looking area may have a biopsy. So sometimes we have women that who has these typical symptoms and that we don't all the imaging, and, but the biopsy first time is negative. So what do you do? You bring the ba patient back two, three weeks later, and you do the biopsy again. And if you don't make a diagnosis, you may have to do a biopsy again. You don't say, bye-bye, and then let's see you in six months. That, that's actually uh, really not a good practice. Now, of course, we, I do have like two patients that even with every effort, we couldn't make a diagnosis, I, and we still don't know. The breast remains to be swollen after even six months, one year, and there's no breast cancer. I mean, could that happen? Yes. I mean, I actually had those kind of patients, and, but it's a scary feeling I have. But many of the patients, by doing a multiple biopsy, you could make that diagnosis. Now, what we need to remember is that the biopsy under the imaging is very painful, more painful than non-IBC patients. So in our clinic, we highly recommend to provide some form of pain medication uh, in their hand. 
Now, you don't want them to take the pain medication uh, without consulting with the, the bi people who biopsy. So in our case, we try to write the, the prescription. They go to the, clinic, uh, to the biopsy clinic, and then depending on the location, how painful it may become or it may not become, our radiology will say that please take the pain medication or don't take a pain medications. So comfort is very important. So then when we do the pathology, we commonly see a very poorly differentiated nuclear grade 3, KI67 is very high. It's usually invasive ductal carcinoma. Can you have an invasive lobular carcinoma? Yes, not common, but you could see it. And you could see tumor emboli or dermal lymphatic invasion. Okay, so uh, the typical uh, pathology that sometimes we get. Uh, diagnosis of inflammatory breast cancer written on pathology report. Okay, they, they do not exist. Okay, uh, in, you cannot make a diagnosis of inflammatory base, breast cancer on pathology. They had these features, so you could suspect it, but you can't make a diagnosis because nobody, uh, this expert has said that because you have tumor emboli, you have IVC. So the moment you see that kind of a pathology, it's, it, to us, it's a concerning. I mean, it may be true that it's a, it's a patient has IVC, but is the pathological review done correctly is something we start to think. So it is not a patho patho it's not based on pathology. You do have to have a breast cancer. Okay, you don't have to have a tumor emboli, you don't have to have a lymphatic invasion, but as long as the, the, the breast is red, you can, make, you can make a diagnosis of inflammatory breast cancer. So let's look at the molecular subtypes, and then the molecular subtype for IBC and non-inflammatory breast cancer. So the non-inflammatory breast cancer that we all know Roughly about 65 to 70% of the patient will have what we call estrogen receptor positive disease, and triple negative is 15%, and there's what we call HER2 positive disease in this area. But you could see in the, uh, this pie chart on the IBC on the left side, roughly 36% of the patient will have estrogen receptor. So it means that, one, the prognosis is not. Uh, no difference among, among these molecular subtypes, but the chance of having ER positivity is less. There is more triple negative uh, inflammatory breast cancer, and there may be a little bit more HER2 positive disease. Okay, so where could the, uh, the disease spread? I told you that when the patient comes to the clinic and they may say, well, my breast got red about three weeks ago, I tried one week of antibiotic, and now with the biopsy, it's a positive disease, then we do a CT scan or PET-CT scan, working and find the disease, well, it could be in chest wall, contralateral breast, anopathy, lungs, profusion, bone, liver, and brain. And one thing that's really important is the contralateral breast. Uh, so there is a tendency that we, fo we focus on the one breast and you don't look the other breast very carefully because uh, the, you see all disease in this area. But we find quite a lot of contralateral uh, axial lymph node embalmment. And you'll be surprised that sometimes they even have different type of breast cancer on the right side. So paying attention into the contralateral breast is very important. And clearly, because of the high rate of uh, metastatic disease, it is important to stage the patient uh, appropriately. So the question is, what should we order? Well, with the era of this insurance company, getting a PET CT scan is very difficult. But as written in the NCCN guideline, or even in our guideline, we highly recommend to get PET CT if you can. I mean. It's not that PET-CT is superior to CT scan with contrast and bone scan, but there are certain things that actually is very helpful in PET-CT. So one is, uh, once again, everything that we talk about is helpful for the surgeon and the radi radiation on course. Not for me, but it's helpful for them because one is uh, this precision of radio 
radiotherapy relies on the extent of lymph node. So you do all these ultrasound and you identify abnormal lymph node, but the PET actually lights up with a normal node, surprisingly sometimes. And then, you, and then you have to start looking carefully and biopsy this area because surprisingly, the lymph node extension is more than you think. So the regular CT or uh, the ultrasound I just talked about may not capture it. So you have a chance that you, you, you could be missing locally uh, because you didn't do the, the right testing. Now, we don't have a prospective data to prove that this is better. So I don't want to, I, I can't claim that PET CT have to be absolute standard, but what we did among us in our group is that we agreed that we would try to get PET CT scan as much as possible. Okay, so uh, this is a, a newly diagnosed IBC. Uh, it's a PET CT scan, a PET scan and PET CT, and you could see that the breast is like, you know, it's a, there's a black ball. I did not put a ball there, just there. It, it's the breast cancer sitting there, and it's really hyper, right? So it's a very active disease. Sugar uptake is high. You don't see this kind of uh, high activity with a non-IVC. These are the, you know, lymph node involvement. For in this case, these lymph node involvement that you see is not always uh, clearly seen with a CT scan or ultrasound. And this imaging is very helpful to be completed before your systemic chemotherapy because the radiation oncologists have to decide what kind of boost they give, what is the extent of the field they should be radiating. Okay, so what do we do with a brain? Okay, so when you actually look into IBC, comparing to non-IBC, clearly there is a higher rate of brain metastasis. That's uh, documented. However, currently we do not have a data to suggest that we should be screening the, these patients with an MRI of the brain. But if they have headache or any kind of uh, neurological symptoms, even if it's mild, uh, we highly recommend to obtaining an MRI of the brain so that uh, we do not miss any uh, brain metastasis. Okay, so let's talk about uh, chemotherapy. And then uh, I am not here to sell MD Anderson, okay? So from all the fairness, I will talk about the other institution. We have actually had a discussion with Dana Farber, Duke, and then trying to make sure that we have a consistent practice in the United States, but still there may be slight difference. And I'll first talk about uh, uh, MD Anderson approach, and then I'll kind of co slightly comp I'll compare with other institutions where the difference is. So, if we, so the first thing is that we should give chemotherapy, but one of the things that's most important, like in triple negative breast cancer, is to provide Paxol or uh, AC. You could give dose dance or you could give weekly. We don't really care. We don't care which sequence you start but it is important that both taxing and anthracycline is provided before surgery. And I'm gonna emphasize this very much. You do not give TC chemotherapy, okay? Not taxotere and cyclophosphamide. You don't give taxol and you don't stop, okay? You have to give taxol and AC. We're talking about four and a half and six months, okay? Whatever it takes, you give chemotherapy. I know it's terrible. That I know we're talking about the de-escalation of treatment, but in this case, you have to shrink it, okay? You have to give it, okay? Uh, and particularly in triple negative, you may want to consider adding carboplatin, particularly with like weekly paclitaxel to further enhance the, the response rate because achieving pathological complete response is the only data we have that would show that it would improve the outcome. And I'm gonna emphasize this like crazy. You have to give chemo and you have to give it time, on a timely manner because I'm gonna tell you that 
one third of patients that I end up seeing counsel is that the treatment got stopped or they can't deliver the chemo in a timely manner. And, and the patient said, well, doc, you know, I, I don't want to torture the patient, but you have to understand the outcome is highly dependent on the response. Uh, estrogen receptor positive IBC, same thing. Why, ER positive, you give chemo aggressively? Yes, even the same thing. You have to try to shrink the tumor as much as possible. HER2 positive, our first choice is to give THP, uh, receptin and pertuzumab uh, for cycle, followed by AC, okay? Uh, we have not yet decided that we could go with TCHP times six. And this is actually that we, it's not that we have evidence, but our backbone of our treatment has based on taxane and anthracycline, and dropping anthracycline has been very difficult to practice. So if you say, well, do we have sufficient of uh, no anthracycline regimen, uh, the answer is we don't. Okay, so this is Anderson and Dana Farber and Northwestern, okay? Pretty much we're exactly the same, okay? I'm not gonna go through this, but it's exactly the same. Dana Farber is making an effort to drop the AC in HER2 positive disease. They're trying to give only uh, her to target drug and taxane, if they get a fantastic response, okay, they should probably go without AC. And that's a great idea. So, uh, and, but that is done under clinical trial. That, that's because I told you that we, do, we don't have evidence. MD Anderson is actually going on the other way around. So now we're giving three anti-HER2 therapy for the HER2 positive disease. I'm not saying that we're right or they're right. We just don't know. One is more intensification, one is more de-escalation. But the middle ground is what I just talked about, okay? So the, the question is that what do we do for adjuvant therapy, okay? Uh, so for triple negative, the CREATE-X data has clearly shown that if you have any residual disease, that it will benefit from kemcitabine. Now that data was not based on inflammatory breast cancer, but taking additional kemcitabine with any residual disease may have a benefit. So we do talk about this. The other is estrogen receptor positive disease. We highly recommend to suppress the ovary and consider aromatase inhibitor with a soft tex regimen, and that's our first choice. And for HER2 positive, all patients, regardless of the response, we recommend pertuzumab and tricizumab because they are considered as a high risk uh, treatment. So I know some of you are not in this field, but what I'd like for you to understand is that our stance of our group is that we provide uh, the treatment based on certain evidence, but not definitive evidence, but we, because of the relapse rate is so high, we tr try to provide the entire treatment and we try not to de-intensify the, the treatment unless we have a clear evidence. Okay, and then pretty much that, when we talk with MD Anderson, Dana Farber, Northwestern, Duke, we're all the same. So your choice of looking for expertise, yes, if all of you could come to MD Anderson, I'm very happy. I know we're taking video, uh, that's not the reason. <laughs> but I think it's really good to go to like Dana Farber or uh, Duke or you know, Northwestern or us, you know. Uh, any places, probably they have same principle. We may say slightly different thing, but the principle is very similar, okay? So let's talk about Surgery, okay? So the bottom line is modified radical mastectomy with axillary lymph node dissection, okay? Uh, currently, there are no other choice outside of uh, st standard care. So here's a couple of things I'd like to talk about. No skin sparing, no breast conservative surgery. Currently, in the United States, there are no data that this is a good practice. Um, 
Is it possible? Maybe the UK has suggested it, but we are not practicing it. Okay. We do not recommend immediate reconstruction because a high rate of relapse in the first one to two years, uh, maybe one year. So at least we like recommend waiting one year. Okay. Get the surgery done, move on to radiation, and wait. Now the other thing that's important is no immediate prophylactic contralateral mastectomy. Many women will come to us and say, please remove the bow's breast. Okay, not to me, but my, my the surgeon, okay? And, uh, and so why? Okay, well, it's because if you remove both breast, the complication rate comparing to unilateral mastectomy is much high. If you have a complication, you will delay the radiation and you will delay other form of necessary adjuvant therapy. And that is detrimental to the outcome. So we highly recommend two-step uh, mastectomy unless there's an immediate need for some kind of medical justification that both breasts needs to come off. And this is something hard to swallow for the patient because even if you're not BRCA positive, still there are fear that it will come back on the other side. And I totally understand that. But the key is to really calm down or face the IBC on the, the ipsilateral breast first and then worry about the contralateral breast later on. So we're pretty much agreeing, uh, except for the UK. Uh, UK always have a, a different opinion uh, for different reasons. That's a joke, actually, but, uh, uh, but, uh, but we all agree uh, that it's important to do uh, mass, uh, modified radical mastectomy, axial lymph node dissection. Sentinel, uh, identifying sentinel is very difficult. We have already done clinical trial, and of course, uh, wo wo women who have IBC, the breast is big, there's a tendency for the weight uh, BMI to be on the higher side, so they are very high risk for lymphedema, okay? But unfortunately, that when we do uh, ex, uh, sentinel mapping, the, the dye will actually permeate all over the place to the point that you can't really reliably identify the, 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 the sentinel lymph node, so we do not recommend, you know, doing sentinel lymph node. Rather, what's more important for lymphedema is that if the woman, uh, really if you have a lymphedema clinic or physical therapy, it is important to really referring the patient early and, and then these days they may do a, what we call lymphatic channel uh, reconnection type of thing. I'm not saying that that should be a, st a standard care up front, but they, every, every player that's related to lymphedema should try to be involved in the care as early as possible for the patient who has IVC. So the radiation therapy, uh, all women should receive or men should receive radiation therapy. Uh, by the way, men do get IVC, but the chance is probably about 0.2 or 0.11%. Oh. So it's uh, usually in a non-IBC, it's about 1%, so it's very uncommon. So what kind of radiation do you give? Well, there are actually, uh, the, if you received uh, the chemotherapy and surgery, and if you have a lot of residual disease, uh, Dr. Woodward will recommend uh, doing a twice a daily uh, radiation for I think like four and a half or five weeks. And if you have a real good response, she'll recommend once a daily over like five, half and a six weeks. But I'm not a radiation oncologist, but my understanding is that I, I keep reminding everybody, but like PET CT and ultrasound and then seeing the patient up front, she will remember the whole area and she will customize so that she really will boost the area that's concerned for recurrence. Okay, so uh, this is a controversial topic. People who have de novo stage four inflammatory breast cancer. So currently, using our standard, uh, guy, uh, standard staging, inflammatory breast cancer does not in exist in stage four, okay? 
It's like, what? It's like, uh, it's true. AJCC only defined inflammatory breast cancer existing in stage three. But we all know that patient will present with IVC and they could have metastatic disease. And once you have metastatic disease, they will bundle all together and call it stage four. And so the word stage four inflammatory breast cancer is something that our group and many of the IVC specialists recognize, but there are some breast physicians that who will not recognize the existence. So why is this important? How do you treat women who have metastatic disease and they have IBC in the breast? Well, some people say, well, you should, because this is not a curable disease, so let's just give you some kind of systemic treatment and see how you do, okay? Well, that's not a good approach. We highly recommend that first thing is whether you could apply like a stage three inflammatory breast cancer approach, meaning that you give systemic chemotherapy, try to shrink the tumor as much as possible, and then to consider potentially surgery. Okay, so that's really like, a, why is he talking like this? Because in non-inflammatory breast cancers, there has been already randomized clinical trial to show that surgery does not improve survival. Well, there's a reason behind this. This is not simply about uh, improving the outcome uh, and how long you live. If the breast does not get control in the IBC, it becomes a major quality of life issue and wound care issue, smell and suffering of the patient. Uh, if you ever taken care of patients who have extensive entire chest wall embalmment, it is a total disaster and really bad situation for the patient. So to prevent this, okay, it is important to think about doing a palliative surgery. Uh, it may not be curative intent, but doing surgery in this condition to do a good local control is important. You don't want to take women who's not responding to go for surgery, but if they're responding well, it's important to do the surgery. But if you're going to do the surgery, you need to make sure that you have mapped the lymph node and extent of the disease very carefully. Because with one mistake, okay, the surgeon may miss the area. And this is where the surgeon, rad onc, and med onc have to work very carefully. So if the team does not exist uh, to really work together closely, it is really not just, it is not a good idea just let's just do the surgery because a mistake will, ha there's a high chance the mistake will happen. It is important to go to a, a clinic that's really has three disciplines that could see the patient almost same time and make that uh, decision together. Okay, so uh, MD Anderson uh, has been dedicated and we're, we call ourselves as Morgan Welch IBC program because Ms. Welch, uh, who was diagnosed soon after the wedding, and she, was, she passed away in, uh, to, uh, at the age of 24. So about 11 years ago, we dedicated uh, uh, the advocates and the state has de um, advocated for that we need to create a clinic. And that's really what the start of our clinic. And then, uh, so there is a lot of, uh, you know, international consortium, and then a, a fantastic investigator uh, uh, from this area. And then we have a, a currently a, a registry that we try to collect samples and we try to come up with a consensus of how we treat our patients. So public education is a key. And I think this has been somewhat uh, like you know, getting this opportunity to talk is really fantastic. And, and so increasing the awareness has really helped to improve uh, how we treat the IBC. We also have a website that provides a video. This video is a slightly old and we're trying to update this, but we have a professional education site. If you're interested, please email me and I'm happy to send you the link. And it talks about much more details than what I'm talking about. Uh, but we're trying to really increase awareness of, for better treatment uh, for the IBC. 
so uh, we also have social media activity uh, from Facebook to Twitter, and and, uh, and we're doing a, like a Facebook Live on a monthly basis. So it's a small, you know, dent in in, in this community. But uh, one of the thing is that this IBC is rare, and the rare disease still matters. And what we we can make a difference by. Uh, working together and trying to increase awareness. Okay, so now the last part, okay, and before you go to bed, uh, and I'll, you know, this will be a nice way to go to sleep, uh, I'll talk about a little bit about research. Okay, so we co constantly talked about, you know, uh, uh, dif different research uh, ongoing. And one of the challenges that we face, and I'm going to oversimplify some of the effort that's been going on, uh, and one is uh, uh, looking for unique gene signature. Okay, everybody wants to know why is inflammatory breast cancer aggressive. So people compare to IBC versus non-IBC, and the funny part is that everybody come up with their own unique idea, including myself. Okay, I'm I'm as guilty as anybody else, and claim that this is the the reason that IBC is potentially uh, it's derived from this genes. But the for example, when you take like three paper and then look the comparison of the, this unique gene, the, the overlap was like zero actually. <laughs> so, so you can see that it's how difficult it is. So why does this happen? Okay, so why? So it happens because part of the issue is that we don't even know how the sample was collected. Remember I told you that the needle may go into the mass, it may not go into the mass, and anything that in the past the sample was very much unclear where the sample is. The diagnosis is not molecular diagnosis. So it's possible that from the beginning the diagnosis was not IVC. So these are all confounding factors that makes it difficult to come up with something unique. And then if IVC is not driven by breast cancer itself, then we have to think about what's happening surrounding of the breast cancer, and that's called cancer microenvironment. So one of the examples is like you know measuring these cytokines in the blood, and then comparing to a patient who has IBC and non-IBC, and some and what we see is that certain unique cytokine is more elevated. So you start to wonder. It, is the reason for inflammatory breast cancer being aggressive is not just simply because what's going on inside of the cancer, but surrounding cancer, uh, surrounding condition, cancer microenvironment is driving the, the aggressiveness of the disease. So yes, there are unique gene pathway that determines a prognosis. We can redefine the gene mutation driver. Huge targets has been clinically proven. Uh, the reality is that despite I talked so much difference about how they present, but if you ask me what is a molecular gene signature comparing to non-IVC, the difference is not very clear. Only thing that's clear is that achieving pathological complete response is from the preoperative chemotherapy is very important. So, this is your homework today to memorize all the targets that exist. And then, uh, so you could see that there are uh, like a, what we call stem nest, cancer stem cell invasion, and EMT-like. There's from PDGF, from EGF, uh, CD44, and then, uh, I'm sorry, uh, from uh, a jack step pathway. So there are many targets that's currently uh, ongoing with the study. But one thing I could tell you that two drugs has not been proven to be uh, effective. One is that because of re the breast is red and it has a lot of blood vessel, so they tried to use bevacizumab, and it has not proven that bevacizumab is particularly effective in IVC. So that's one thing. One, ten years ago, there was people felt that lapatinib was a unique drug, and they. Th this may be unique to IBC, but that also didn't uh, work out. So currently, the two major effort is one from Dana Farber, uh, Lixolitinib, which uh, targets the, the 
the, uh, the STEP pathway, uh, and MD Anderson is uh, targeting the EGFR, and with a panitumumab, which is a humanized anti-EGFR antibody. And this is all clinical trials. I'm not, this is nothing standard care, but we think that these are the potential uh, two promising targets that we need to prove that this could become a standard care over this another five to 10 years. So my uh, uh, interest is in this EGFR, which is really like a brother and sister of the uh, HER2. And EGFR as a therapeutic target, EGFR is associated as a poor pro prognosis. So indeed, when you have EGFR overexpressing, there is a, uh, uh, the prognosis is worse than people who are negative. So uh, the model is that EGFR, okay, so the, I, I'm not gonna show any basic science data, but the, when you treat with EGFR, you could regulate the inflammation. Inflammation regulates what we call TGF beta pathway and it regulates the stem cells. I know people are falling asleep now, actually, I could see it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so please do not worry, I will not ask questions. But uh, we do think that EGFR has a role in inflammatory breast cancer. So we actually did conduct a clinical trial in inflammatory breast cancer. So this is a hurt we published in Lancet Oncology. I'm sorry, it's in press, but it's actually we did publish in Lancet Oncology this year that this is a neoadjuvant panitumumab plus uh, low HER2 uh, IBC, meaning that it could be triple negative or estrogen receptor positive. A after their diagnosis, they will receive panitumumab, then they will receive NAP, paclitaxel, carboplatin, and they received FEC. Uh, every three weeks times four, and they went for surgery, and we measured uh, what we call the, the pathological complete response. So what we found in this population, so this is basically investigational treatment with uh, inflammatory breast cancer, and what we found is that the PCR rate uh, on the triple negative breast cancer was 47%. So, and and then if you add what we call RCV1, like a tiny bit of disease left, then 65% the of the patient had a, a what we call patho close to patho pathological complete response. And if it's estrogen receptor positive, it was 15 and 15%. So why is this very important? Okay, it's like, okay, well, it sounds like a reasonable number for non-IBC. Well, so, so our historical data, okay, so non-IBC, you, you know, I talked about chemotherapy multiple times. In the historical data in TNVC with non-IBC, the PCR is about 30 to 40%. Our historical data achieving that PCR is only 12%. See this, it's only 12% I want you to understand, okay? I told you PCR is very important, but it's only one out of 10 or two out of 10 of my patients achieve PCR. So when we see, this is a single arm study, but when we see like 44%, we're like, wow, was like, what happened to our regimen? You know, something, you know, uh, it, this could be a fluke or this could be, you know, something uh, that EGFR, targeting EGFR may have activity. And then we looked into these uh, like, the target like EGFR and inflammation, and indeed uh, the activity correlates with suppressing these uh, pathways. And I'm not gonna go in detail, but we look for molecular markers. So currently what we're doing, because we haven't proven that this is really EGFR related, we are doing a randomized clinical trial, and we're uh, actually randomizing between people who have uh, anti-EGFR uh, antibody with panitumumab versus no panitumumab. And then what we wanna show is that between the two arms, this arm will have a higher PCR comparing to this one. So this is an ongoing study to prove that panitumumab have some role in uh, e uh, inflammatory breast cancer. So we think that uh, Anderson Group, Morgan Welch think that EGFR is an important target, and this is one of our major efforts uh, to understand how is it related to inflammation on cancer stem cell, how does it affect the tumor and microenvironment, and so we're making a lot of effort in preclinical study to understand uh, uh, the triple negative IBC. So there are many other things I, uh, that we could target based on what we call cancer microenvironment. So this is a review that we published in a Nature Review uh, 
uh, Nature Cancer Review. And what we're trying to show here is that this is all immune system, okay? And what we're, one is that targeting like immune checkpoint, targeting like macrophage, and there are many different targets and drugs that's coming up at this moment. So, so we're kind of excited about it because, you know, in the old, in the past, we've been focusing on giving chemotherapy and then trying to expand targeted therapy, but we really never have really chance to go into these, uh, what we call immunotherapy, because IBC has a unique uh, well, uh, immune, immunological changes uh, that we could potentially target. So the first thing that we've been looking into is use of what we call statin, you know, uh, cholesterol drug. So why is it important? Because the one of the reasons that cholesterol drug is effective in non-cancer setting is because it reduces inflammation. Uh, so when you have high cholesterol, it forms a plaque in your endothelial cells and it causes inflammation. So people measure C-reactive protein and they try to figure out how effective these statin could be. And indeed, when you do retrospective chart review and look into whether statin is effective or not, we notice that people who take anti-cholesterol drug does better than people who don't take it. So that's an interesting data. And so therefore, we're currently trying to strategize what we could do for our IBC patients. So, and I'll just, you know, finish very quickly uh, uh, after just talking about our strategy. One is in triple negative, we will give panitumumab. For HER2, uh, we will try to provide three anti-HER2 therapy in neoadjuvant setting. Denafarber is going towards the other direction. Uh, we are also giving uh, anti, uh, I'm sorry, pan -HER kinase inhibitor with pachytaxel. This is before. And if you have any residual disease, for triple negative, we're trying to see if we should be considering uh, statin. The, for estrogen receptor positive disease, we try to give uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor and endocrine therapy. So this is a metastatic inflammatory breast cancer. So metastatic inflammatory breast cancer is dominantly uh, clinical trial is driven by immune uh, uh, pembrolizumab, atezolizumab, pembrolizumab. So these are all immunotherapy-based therapy. One is to give standard chemotherapy, shrink it, and use immunotherapy as a maintenance, or you do like a triple combination to see if we could actually shrink the tumor much better by targeting with immunotherapy and MEK inhibitor and chemotherapy. So these are the th things that we're trying to come up with a better treatment. We are also uh, trying to do what we call TVEC. TVEC is, as you know, is used for melanoma. You inject the virus into the tumor and lyse the tumor and try to make it immunogenic. So uh, I'm not saying that this is going to be effective or not, but standard chemotherapy effectiveness is so much limited uh, we need to do multiple clinical trials. And Dana-Farber has its own unique trial, Duke has its unique trials, and what's really important is to have access to these trials. So one thing, you know, I'm going to end here, but uh, uh, one that's important uh, in IBC research is that it's a very patient-centered driven research. So why is it? Because many of our, you know, we are very fortunate to be able to do clinical trial research, not because we, you know, we got grants very easily. The reality was really uh, advocate uh, really uh, helped us to really reach out to the politicians and community and raise money. And that money allowed to create infrastructure. And that infrastructure resulted into uh, getting grants and conducting clinical trials. So it's one of these, you know, Kaizen model that it go, goes back and forth. And that allowed us uh, for our 10 year history to, ma to make it better. And I think it's very similar with Dana Farber in every places. And most time it's really driven by N NIH or NCI, but this is a very different disease how it developed over the past 10 years. So the conclusion is, it's a tough disease. It's a heterogeneous disease. It is, we do need to understand. I mean, the standard care, there's many things that we still have to address, but 
the, we do think that the, the, our future is immune system and understanding inflammation. And we believe that both targeting cancer as well as cancer microenvironment is going to make a difference. And I, we believe strongly that in 10 years later that we will come up with a better treatment. So these are all my uh, fundings and our fundings and multiple patients who has been really helping us to take us to the next levels. And uh, these are my acknowledgement. So uh, please feel free to email me. Uh, and I'm on Twitter called Team Oncology. Um, if you want to become friend with me in Facebook, please uh, friend me. But, uh, but please uh, say that you send me a message that you did attend because uh, if you, I cannot tell the who's friending me. And, and <laughs> I just don't like casually accept everybody as a friend, actually. So, but I am willing to become a friend if you send me a message that you said, I did attend that. You know? And if you tell me that this was a good talk, that I'll prove it. Thank you very much. Yeah.